glad that we could get together again this week for our midweek Bible study. This study will be posted on September 9th and will be in anticipation of our Sunday worship time and the sermon within that time focusing on these same texts. Our texts today are uh, one from the Old and one from the New Testament from Numbers chapter 21 and then from the New Testament, John chapter 3. Sometimes I think Christians dismiss the Old Testament or at least, uh, if not dismissing it, give it give it too little consideration uh, without realizing that if and when they do, uh, they miss so much about the New Testament. Uh, for in order to get the fullest interpretation and understanding of the New Testament, a working knowledge of the Old Testament is essential. Now, as you uh, do your study, especially in the New Testament, a legitimate study guide will generally help you make the connections with the Old Testament and certainly use those. But don't shortchange yourself uh, and your Old Testament awareness by basing that awareness only on what the guides provide you. Uh, when the guide directs you to an Old Testament passage, read and study that passage for yourself in addition to what a study guide may uh, give you. Uh, this week's scripture lessons uh, from Numbers 21 uh, verses 4 through 9 is what we'll read together. And also John chapter 3, 13 through 17 provide us with one example of a very strong connection between an Old Testament teaching and a New Testament event. In John 3, and we'll read a larger uh, passage than just John 3, 13 through 17. Uh, in John 3, looking at the broader context of that brief passage that we look at on Sunday, we get several other uh, references that will help make a strong connection or that are based on a strong connection between an Old Testament uh, and a New Testament reference. Let's read uh, our scripture together from John chapter 21. I'm sorry, from Numbers chapter 21. We're reading about uh, the people of Israel, uh, the Hebrews, whatever name you want to refer to them at this point. But the, the people of Israel have left uh, Egypt. They're under Moses' direction. This is a part of the Exodus event, and they are making their way in a wandering fashion uh, from Egypt toward uh, the Promised Land. Uh, picking up in the middle of the story, or in the midst of the story, Numbers 21, 4 and following, then they, the Hebrews, set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water. And we loathe this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. They said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when that person looks at it, looks at the serpent, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. And it came about that if the serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. And now for the New Testament, I want to read our text is specific, John 3, 13 through 17. But I want to read the first 12 verses along with 13 through 17 to give us a um, better appreciation for the context of what we read in 13 through 17. Beginning in John 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these things that you do 
unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever lived, believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So we have before us in John uh, Nicodemus' visit to Jesus. Uh, now, it's only in John's gospel, the other three, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do not give us the story of Nicodemus. And there are three references in John, and we'll talk more about them on Sunday night, I hope. But we have here uh, the most information we get about Nicodemus. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, uh, a ruler of the Jews, in other words, one of the leading religious leaders of his day. Now, obviously, we do not have the whole conversation uh, between Jesus and Nicodemus, uh, but it is very apparent that it centered around Nicodemus' desire to understand better who Jesus was uh, and what was Jesus' understanding of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, a very prominent matter of conversation and uh, discussion and anticipation among the Jews of Jesus' earthly ministry days. So Jesus talks to Nicodemus uh, about uh, a new birth, about uh, one in order to become a part of the kingdom of God, in order to enter the kingdom of God, one had to uh, be uh, born again or born from above the the term there can support either of the translations, but uh, both of them are suggestive of new birth, uh, starting over. Uh, Nicodemus is either confused by this uh, response uh, on Jesus' part, or he is using a, a technique of conversation by restating what Jesus has said and restating it in the form of a question going almost to the absurd in order to get Jesus to uh, continue to explain uh, what he means uh, by you must be born again. Jesus uh, wants Nicodemus and through Nicodemus us to see that the kingdom of God is beyond what uh, we would understand as a human institution. Uh, in human terms, uh, the kingdom of God in the days of the first century Jews, uh, the kingdom of God might be seen with some strong human overlappings, uh, a time for uh, a major uh, military campaign against the Roman uh, rulers, a time to throw off that Roman yoke and restore Israel as a nation uh, to uh, David and Solomon uh, kingdom-like successes. If you got to go back to the Old Testament and see what David and Solomon were able to do in their leadership 
uh, of Israel, the nation. And since that time, as the nation had disintegrated, and certainly by the time of the first century, the uh, kingdom of Israel under David and Solomon's leadership was held up as the pinnacle of the historical pinnacle for Israel and understanding the kingdom of God as being a time for uh, a restoration uh, of that great successful time in Israel's history. Jesus, rather than following in that line, begins to explain to Nicodemus that the kingdom of God should be understood as a spiritual entity. Uh, it was not that Jesus was not concerned about the human or about the earthly, uh, but he wanted to elevate Nicodemus' understanding to be so much higher uh, than even uh, the idea of a restoration of a Davidic kind of kingdom. So he explains the kingdom from spiritual perspective. He says a human being is born of a human mother. And a human mother, uh, from the conception with a human father, a human set of parents can only give birth uh, to uh, another human being. And he takes that further and says, so any only someone born of the Spirit of God can enter into this spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus uses a term here that uh, he talks about the wind blowing uh, wherever it will. You don't know where it comes from. This is verse 8 uh, or where it is going, but you can see the result. You can see the, uh, the leaves on the tree rippling. The, if it's a heavy wind, you can see the tree even bending to it. So the, the wind seems to almost have a mind of its own. It cannot be controlled. Well, the, the term that is translated here, verse 8, uh, the term wind uh, is in both the Old Testament Hebrew and in the New Testament Greek language. Uh, both of those languages use the term that is translated wind. Uh, the term is also very appropriately, appropriately translated spirit depending on the context where that word is being used. Well, one of the symbols of the Spirit of God in the Bible is the wind or, or breath. Uh, we find this in Job in the Old Testament, uh, later in John chapter 20 and Acts chapter 2 in that uh, early days of the work of the Spirit within the church. And like the wind, the Spirit is invisible but very powerful. And you cannot predict or explain the movements of the wind. And we can't always predict or explain the movements of God's Spirit. Well, when Jesus uses this symbol, uh, it is likely that Nicodemus would have thought of Ezekiel 37 and the first 14 verses. Uh, I'll, if you want to jot that down, Ezekiel 37, uh, read the story there of the the Valley of Dry Bones. I'm not going to take time to go and read that, but you can pause and go read that if you would like. But we know from that story, uh, some of the details of the story, the prophet saw a valley full of, of dead bones, dry bones. They'd been there long enough to have completely dried. But when the prophet prophesied at God's instruction, when he prophesied to the wind, the spirit, remember, same word, wind, spirit, when he prophesied to the wind, the spirit came and gave the bones life. Uh, again, it was the combination of the spirit of God and the word of God. Jesus proclaimed the word of God uh, to Nicodemus and to others. Jesus being the word of God in conjunction with the spirit of God, bringing life, renewal, restoration, and new life. So here in Ezekiel, the story where the combination of the Spirit of God and the Word of God used to bring life to these dry bones. Uh, Nicodemus, being a, a student of uh, that day's scripture, would have uh, understood this reference without Jesus having to go into any more detail. Here again, a case of an Old Testament uh, 
story or an Old Testament reading that lends so much deeper meaning uh, to the New Testament reference if you know that Old Testament uh, referral. Um, so the nation of Israel, if you want to bring it into first century uh, contemporary setting, uh, and Nicodemus was probably challenged or even convicted by this, the nation of Israel, which would have included Nicodemus and his fellow religious leaders, uh, Jesus is suggesting very blatantly that uh, Israel's dead and hopeless, like that valley of dry bones, uh, in spite of the morality and the religion of the people, which was intense. They needed the life that only the Spirit of God could bring them. Then Jesus, further down, as he talks about this with uh, Nicodemus, uh, he says in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. We've already looked at that passage from Numbers chapter 21. This is an obvious and direct reference to uh, that. Nicodemus would have known that reference most likely. Uh, and this is another case where knowing the Old Testament helps us to understand and interpret uh, the New Testament. Uh, that story from the Old Testament, I'm borrowing from Warren Wiersbe for some of this. He encapsulated it uh, very well. Uh, the serpent on the pole, this Numbers 21 story, is a story of sin. First of all, the nation rebelled against God and they had to be punished. And God sent uh, what are described as fiery serpents, that is poisonous serpents, uh, among the people. And those snakes bit the people. Many of them died. Uh, think for a minute, and we'll talk a little bit more about this Sunday night, I hope. Uh, the people's rebellion was they got impatient with God and with the fulfillment of God's plan for them. They were wandering around. They didn't seem to be making direct progress toward getting to where uh, they wanted to be going, where they had promised they would be going. And so they began to grumble against God. And of course, they began grumbling against Moses, who was God's appointed leader for the Israelites. Uh, so their, their sin was in their grumbling, in their complaining, in their impatience with God. Uh, it's also a story about grace. Uh, when God sent the snakes among them and many of them began to die, they came running to Moses. They'd been grumbling about him earlier, but they came running to Moses and said, pray for us. Uh, pray for us that God will spare us in essence. We have sinned, verse 7, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord. And you intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. Now, in, we know Moses was not spiteful here because if, if he was, he could have very easily said, hey, forget it. You've been upset with me, complaining, griping about me. Uh, you figure this out for yourself. But the rest of verse 7 tells us that Moses interceded for the people. He went to God and made entreaty for them uh, on their behalf. So, uh, this is a story of grace. He, provide, he interceded for the people and God provided a remedy. Uh, it may sound to us and our understanding of Western medicine as a uh, strange remedy, but God Moses to, uh, to make a, a fiery serpent, in other words, uh, an image or a, a, uh, a replica of a serpent and put it up on a pole. Uh, and he says, it shall come about that everyone who is bitten when he looks at the serpent up on the pole, he will live. Uh, so the grace was that any stricken person who looked at the serpent would immediately uh, be healed. And so you see the obvious reference here. Moses put the snake up on a pole so that those who looked up at the snake uh, were healed. And Jesus says here, uh, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man, referring to himself, must be lifted up. So this story of grace is also a story of faith. When the people looked up, 
They were demonstrating faith. If they didn't believe it would help them, if they didn't believe there was any value in looking up, they would not have looked up. But they looked up by faith, and they were saved from the poison or from death uh, as a result of being bitten by the snake. Uh, now, Jesus uses the idea of being lifted up. This term uh, has a, a dual meaning here in uh, this passage from John. Uh, it means, first of all, lifted up to be crucified, uh, John 8, 28, John 12, 32 through 34. But the, me the, the verb also means to be glorified, to be exalted when he's lifted up, when he's honored, when he's held up by God in honor. Uh, in John's gospel, uh, John points out that, it, that, that our Lord's crucifixion was actually the means of his glorification. Uh, the cross was not the end of God's glory. It was the means of his glory. Again, Acts chapter 2, we get that, we get that spelled out. So in like manner, Jesus says, as the serpent was lifted up on that pole, so the Son of Man be, would be lifted up on a cross. Why? Well, to save us from sin and the death penalty that sin brings with it. The Old Testament people to save them from the poisonous bite of the serpent that God, serpents that God had sent among them uh, in God's response to their rebellion. Uh, in the camp of Israel, uh, Wiersbe points this out. I thought it was interesting. The the solution to the solution to the serpent problem was not in killing the serpents, or in making medicine, or in pretending that the serpents were not there. In other words, try to ignore them. The solution didn't come from passing anti-serpent laws, or even from trying to climb the pole. The answer was very straightforward, very simple. Uh, the solution, the saving solution to the serpents was to look by faith at the serpent that had been lifted up. Uh, why was this the solution? Uh, why was there not another solution? Well, I think it may sound overly simplistic, but this was the solution because it was the solution God gave. As we usually find with God, God's solution to whatever dilemma we take to God, uh, to follow that solution requires faith. In the case of the serpents in the wilderness or in the desert, only if someone believed the solution would that person look up. And so we have, as Jesus uses this picture from the Old Testament, we know that, that, that our whole world has been bitten by sin. Paul tells us in Romans that the wages of sin is death. And so God has sent his son to be lifted up on the cross, to be crucified and glorified, not only for Israel, but for the whole world. And how is a person born from above? How is he or she saved from eternal perishing? By believing on Jesus Christ, by looking to him in faith. And then Jesus, of course, gives us those most uh, famous uh, words, certainly in John's gospel, and for many believers, uh, the uh, first and in some cases perhaps only uh, verse that we've memorized, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, uh, his one and only unique, one-of-a-kind Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whoever believes in him, or whoever believes in him, believes will in him have eternal life, verse 15. Uh, but we memorize verse 16, but sometimes uh, stopping there, we miss the uh, most full meaning of what Jesus says, where he continues in verse 17 to say, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Uh, this, as I mentioned in the story of the, the serpents in the, in the desert, this reminds us that the story of Jesus, while it is a story of dealing with sin, it is also a story of grace, for it is through God's grace that God provides us with the eternal solution 
to sin. So as we keep looking up to the glorified Lord, uh, we embrace our salvation. And as we continue to look, we continue to grow in our faith. And that keeps us looking up. And the more we look up, the greater is our faith. And the greater is our faith, the more we look up. So keep looking to Jesus, uh, the means of our, our salvation. Keep looking to Jesus as an expression of your faith in him. Amen. Quick reminder that we uh, are planning an evening uh, worship time this Sunday at 6 o'clock under the oak trees across the street from our offices and our sanctuary. Uh, bring a chair or for every person that uh, comes along with you. We have had some uh, wonderful times, got some special music planned as we've all done, and we've got some special guests for the children. So bring your children, and I think they can look forward to a special time, and then they will have some time together uh, later in the service uh, while we continue our, our worship. Uh, as we've been doing, we continue to have a worship time live on Sunday mornings at 9 and at 10.30. And those services are also available uh, on a streaming uh, platform. You can see them either through Facebook or uh, YouTube. As you take advantage of these uh, ways to stay connected with your church family and continue the very essential uh, spiritual practice of worship. Thank you for joining with me today. Uh, may God's... Uh, presence. Uh, bless our together, uh, even though it is not physically, uh, that, and even though we are not physically present, uh, may God's presence allow us to be together around the scripture.